welcome. My name is John Tunnell, and on behalf of the Digital Assembly, uh, thanks for coming. Uh, we're really excited for this event. First, I want to thank our sponsors, the University Libraries, particularly Dean Judy Russell for enthusiastically supporting our vision of the symposium, Barbara Hood for her outstanding job of promoting it, and Misty Swain for planning tonight's reception, as well as our other sponsors, Image Text and the Graduate Film Studies Reading Group for doubling our budget. Um, and big thanks to Terry Harpel, the faculty advisor for uh, Digital Assembly, who stepped out. <laughs> um, thanks to his initiative and suggestions that uh, really inspired us to go big on this one. And of course, thank you to all our invited speakers for saying yes to us. The topic of this symposium, Digital Platforms and the Future of Books, builds upon the success of the 2010 Digital Assembly Conference. That conference was called The Future of Digital Studies, and its proceedings are now being published across two issues of the online open access journal, Digital Humanities Quarterly. In the words of the 2010 conference organizer, organizers, many of the presentations there spoke to an all-encompassing ontological shift now underway as a consequence of, increasingly of the increasingly pervasive presence of the digital in our relations with machines and their processes. Over the next two days, we'll focus on our relations with books, our relations with digital platforms, and on the complex relations of parents and potential to books and digital media. What happens to books in a digital age? Do digital technologies threaten the future of books, or is the relationship more symbiotic or dialogic? Is an e-book still a book? And as books continue to be digitized and even born digital, what consequences gather for the future of reading and the future of writing? What opportunities are there for invention and intervention? Certainly, the presentations will open up further questions, and I'm pretty confident that we'll be all eager to explore those. Um, each session will last an hour and 15 minutes, We'll have 45 minutes for the featured speaker, 10 minutes for the respondent, and then about 15 minutes for Q&A. Our introductions will be brief. Our first speaker is Elizabeth Swanstrom, an assistant professor in the English department at Florida Atlantic University. She's already amassed a fairly extensive range of experiences working on digital humanities projects, both nationally and internationally. She'll mention some of these in her talk. Most recently, her research has appeared in the journals Science Fiction Studies and Contemporary Literature, and in the edited collection, A Sense of Wonder, A Century of Science Fiction. Between her scholarship and her work in cutting-edge digital and humanities initiatives, we think Elizabeth is an excellent fit for this event, and we're thrilled to have her kick things off. Sweden uh, for digital humanities research. 
and you can see all the logos um, up there. Um, but it was as a graduate student involved with a really outstanding project um, that I was pushed to think seriously and reflexively about the future of reading. The Transliteracies Project um, is a multi-campus research initiative at the University of California. It's headed by Alan Loom at Santa Barbara. And it's devoted to the study of online reading. One goal of the Transliteracies Project is to produce some kind of tool or heuristic for improving online reading in the online reading environment. And such a tool must consider the ways that reading is evolving in such an environment. And when I started Transliteracies, I had some assumptions about reading in partnership with digital technology. Um, digital technology inhibits reading as an absorptive, focused, and individual act. Reading with digital technology diminishes the importance of the human body. Reading online or in partnership with digital technology is not really reading, uh, but a collection of activities that include searching, surfing, scanning, browsing, and sifting through information. I can't speak to what assumptions uh, the other members of the project had, but I think it's safe to say that uh, these assumptions are pretty pervasive in the conversation about what it means to read in partnership with digital technology. My job with Transliteracies was to work through uh, wonderful texts about the history, present, and future of reading. I also had the opportunity to synthesize what I'd learned in research reports for others to read, and as I read through this incredible sampling from the history of reading, I began to realize that my assumptions about reading needed some radical retooling, not only about my own personal reading habits, but about what it has meant to read throughout literary history. For example, one of the most central tensions in literary studies in the 20th century was the tension between new critical text-based hermeneutics and the more expansive notion of cultural studies as a mode of engagement writ broad. Far from settled, we're still seeing the ripple effects of this tension today in the form of a constant friction between the central tenets of each camp. On the one hand, the new critical emphasis upon close, careful reading of the text itself, and on the other, the cultural studies tendency for linking that same text to a larger social fabric. It's perhaps then not terribly surprising that one of the most pressing issues of literary studies in the 21st century is the continued tension between reading closely and reading with a larger view. Reading, as it were, with a microscope and with a wide-angle lens. Although these tensions continue to echo within virtually every field within the humanities and social sciences, they are gaining new energy and new traction within the field of the digital humanities, an ambiguous scholarly interzone that seems to embrace the tools of computation for close, careful literary exegesis at the same time that online digitally born works of literature seem to threaten the traditional boundaries of what counts as a text in the first place. In other words, the stakes of reading in relation to digital technology um, are incredibly high, both for literary studies rich history as well as where the field will head in the future. So in this presentation, I zoom in and out of reading practices of the past and present to speculate about the future. I want to challenge these assumptions that many of us have had or, or continue to have about reading. In particular, I'd like to rethink one claim about the way reading practices are said to be in flux in response to contemporary technologies. This is the claim that reading works online results in a distracted, superficial reading experience, one that threatens to usurp something that we value highly, which is to say deep, absorptive reading. At the same time, I hope to show that the central criticisms levied against contemporary reading, that it is fragmented, dispersed, and distracted, are in fact features of reading we can trace all the way back to antiquity. In order to do so, I'll be looking at three fairly contemporary case studies. Helen Mehmet's exquisite piece of electronic literature, Lexia to Perplexia, Jeffrey Shaw's art installation, Legible City, and a peculiar section of William Gibson's famous science fiction novel, Neuromancer, a novel that helped launch the very notion of cyberspace. In some ways, by, focus, uh, excuse me, by focusing upon such a diverse assortment of works, I run the risk in this presentation of performing the very same scattered, distracted, and disorganized reading experience that I want to say is not the default reading experience today. However, because I want to point out larger historical tendencies, the zooming out in order to zoom in on specific longer term uh, patterns seems justified. I began by foregrounding one claim about the way reading practices are said to be in flux. This claim that reading works online results in a distracted experience 
that threatens to destroy uh, close reading. So where does this term, close reading, come from? It's a literary term, to be sure, but instead of turning to the, uh, the usual suspects, uh, to Clint Brooks, Wim Sutton Beardsley, John Crow Ransom, etc., I'd like to step outside of literary studies proper for a moment and consider an image. To the outside observer, the practice of deep reading might look something like this 1937 painting by Picasso, <clears throat> young girl reading a book on the beach. In this case, reading is so absorptive that the girl seems turned into herself. Her shoulders curl over, almost engage in ampuloskepsis, navel gazing. The act of reading takes up the entire frame, becomes its own self-sufficient landscape, at the exclusion of the external surroundings. Nor is this painting unique for its portrayal of reading as an isolating experience. Consider, for example, a few images uh, in, in the history of art. Here we have reading by gaslight, and you have this piece of food just far enough away that the reader can't reach it, the pleasures of eating deferred by the absorbing task of, of reading. Or we have Toulouse-Lautrec's uh, great uh, painting of Dale reading a newspaper in the garden, with the reader's back turned to us completely, kind of shutting us out from that reading experience. And then finally, this one, where the reader doesn't exist at all in this painting by Widow. It's simply um, become its own self-sufficient entity, the, the, the print uh, material. In each instance, the book becomes the world. And the only way to access this world is to exclude or defer the world around it. There are many problems with such an understanding of reading that I'll return to in my concluding section, but for now I want to challenge this idea of close, attentive reading as possible only with the printed word. But surely one might object, this type of absorption is only possible with print. Surely the deep, reflective, sustained interaction with text is only possible with the tactile pleasure afforded by pages, ink, and the material specificity of paper. Surely such a sustained reading is precluded by the electronic medium. If titles such as Who's Killing Deep Focus Reading, a New York Times article on the Paper Cuts blog, and no irony there, um, are any indication, deep reading is opposed to online reading. Reading online involves different processes. It plays out across different substrates, and yet yields different pleasures than those afforded from reading print. If this is true, what are we to make of this image of a reading hood, which was highlighted on the blog Pop Gadget. It's no Picasso, uh, but again, the act of reading takes up the entire frame, becomes its own self-sufficient landscape at the exclusion of its surroundings. Here's what the author Ho Yun Kim had to say about it. This concept product, the computer hood, looks so ridiculous, and yet I think it would be really useful if we could get over appearances. Not only would it provide shade, but privacy too, which is what it's designed for. This is, of course, only one humorous example of a vision of deep reading on the computer, and who knows what dark arts are being performed beneath that hood. But since I'm about to embark on an analysis of an extremely dislocated and dispersed reading environment, I want to offer as a preamble this claim that the medium does not preclude deep reading. The computer hood speaks to the desire for sustained focus reading um, in partnership with digital technology. <clears throat> My first case study is Talon Mehmet's piece of electronic literature, Lexia to Perplexia. As we shall see, this text requires that the reader engage in both the deep, close reading of cryptic prose, as well as the ability to navigate this prose by surfing, or in the author's words, hopscotching across it. Reading such works requires an expansion, not a replacement of a traditional analytic toolkit. The work is inaccessible without the cultural competency on the computer, without the ability to skip across surfaces of image and text. Yet the work is meaningless without the ability to read it carefully and closely within the context of literary and visual history, with careful attention and depth of focus. Created for the Trace Online Writing Community in 2000, Alexia to Perplexia is comprised of four sections divided into a series of thickly layered web pages, each of which leads to further layers before linking to a new page. The text is a mixture of DHTML and JavaScript, which, when strung together, forms a fragmented narrative that is visually complemented by empty grids, snippets of code, and cluttered signs of death and mourning. When the reader first accesses Lexia to Perplexia, she's presented with this title page. The subtitle, Hypermediation, Ideascope, and a set of four options, which are listed much like a table of contents. In the first page of this section, 
of white text, uh, in the first page of the section, a paragraph of white text lies upon a gray square, surrounded by a black background aligned on top of a two-way arrow. The paragraph ends with a string of code. In the syntax of hypertext markup language, the words head and body are some of the most basic tags needed to construct a web page. By inserting the word face between them, the barest sketch of a human body emerges, buried under a block of inscrutable code and layered over a line of flow. The two-way arrow beneath the block suggests a flowchart comprised of procedures, loops, decision points, and input-output boxes. Such a diagram maps the logical sequences that make up a program before writing the actual code. In this context, the rectangular graphic functions as a procedure block within it, that is to say, an element used to perform an operation before moving on to the next sequence. The work makes exceptional demands of the reader, both in, term of the close, both in terms of the close attention it requires the reader to pay to the syntax of the pseudocode, as well as to the rich layers of literary history that the reader excavates as she makes her way through the text. Lexia to Perplexia is filled with thresholds to different spatial and temporal zones. Hidden fissures in the text abound. In her search for cohesion and points of transition, the reader soon discovers that each screen acts as an interface between distinct spatial realms. Patient clicking, for example, yields a point of transport to a section called cost space. This environment, while well, as abstract as the spaces that precede it, invokes an entirely different time and place. The references to ancient Egyptian burial rituals and the term ka, as well as the use of the more delicately wrought blue hieroglyphics and the black background, create a space that is experienced differently than the spaces of previous sections. It offers access to spaces that are coded according to different temporal moments than those that dominate the rest of the text. And here I'd like to zoom out and consider such moments within the larger landscape of literary history. The abstract places in Lexia to Perplexia are not the first landscapes to afford access to different temporal and spatial states. In the tradition of romantic expression, for example, the landscape often acts as a physical, visible trigger of memory and reflection for the act of repose. And while I don't want to strain the comparison, it's worth considering the function of the landscape in William Wordsworth's Tintern Abbey for just one example in relation to the role of the interface in Lexia to Perplexia. In order to suggest that poems such as these anticipate certain key features of digital art, and to suggest, of course, that works such as Lexia to Perplexia emerge from a very long literary tradition. In Wordsworth's piece, the poet's meditation on different temporal and experiential states hinges upon carefully described space. In the opening stanza, the act of repose is dependent upon the spatial location that the poet inhabits. Repose happens here under this dark sycamore, and is shown throughout the poem to be limited temporally by the duration of his physical presence at this particular vantage point, while I here stand. The act of reflection is fundamentally linked to the landscape around the poet, and is a result of his ability to, phys to physically synchronize with his surroundings. Once synchronized, the poet then uses the landscape both as a way to trigger and retrieve his memories, as well as a space upon which to project potential future experiences. Through it, he's able to conceive of himself as someone who exists in multiple temporal zones, present in this moment and in future years. That the same image within the landscape <coughs> provides access to both external, the external world and the poet's internal subjective state suggests that rather than marking a rigid border or perimeter, the landscape instead offers hinges or pivoting points between internal and external perspectives. This act of hinging or pivoting is crucial in navigating digital works such as Lexia and Perplexia, because although the landscapes we encounter in this work do not offer places of rest, they're thoroughly perforated with pivotal points of transport. By zooming out from Lexia to Perplexia to look at tendencies in romantic tradition, and there are many others we could turn to, we see that, the one, that one of the key features of reading online, transport, syncs up very closely with literary history. From the many hours I spent with it, uh, Lexia to Perplexia confounded my assumption that reading online is antithetical to close reading. But it did not resolve the second assumption I held, which is to say that the human body is diminished when it reads in partnership with digital technology. Lexia to Perplexia does not resolve this persistent assumption so much as it crystallizes and complicates it. 
For example, at the same time that the flow lines of Lexia to Perplexia invite the reader to move farther into the site, the motionless gray square on top of it bears some resemblance to a gravestone, a somber static monument whose epitaph ends with the closed HTML tag instead of a date. Read this way, the page invites, uh, both encourages the reader to contemplate the death of the human subject, even as it invites her to enter the site and observe the particular way the subject has become dismantled in the network environment. Because of this complicated status of the human body here, it would seem that the body itself becomes an afterthought or a discarded accessory uh, once human beings merge with comput computational network systems. And scholars such as M. Catherine Hales and Mark Bian Hansen have done great work to show that this is not as simple as it sounds. But I'd like to turn now to a work that foregrounds the reader's body unambiguously. And this is my second case study of Jeffrey Shaw's Legible City. Shaw's Legible City is an immersive art installation comprised of an interactive reading interface that requires active physical participation from its viewers. To make the installation function, a rider sits on a stationary bicycle, pedals, and navigates through city streets and architectural structures made of letters, words, and sentences that are projected onto a large screen. In this manner, the viewer both rides and reads as she navigates through this text-based virtual space. Requiring, as it does, the active participation of the user, I suggest that Shaw's installation offers a way for us to imagine reading as a fully embodied social and shared experience, and a physical activity in which the human body is well integrated into its surrounding environment, and in which the text is literally configured through the reader's physical interaction with the reading interface. In this piece, to borrow from Mark Hansen, who writes about Shaw and new, philo new philosophy for new media, um, among other pieces, the body functions as an active in-framer, processor, selector, and producer of the excited experience. First conceived of in 1988, Legible City has evolved into three versions over a 10-year period of time. The first is the Legible City prototype, which debuted in 1988 as a set of wireframe graphics displayed on a large computer screen that looked like this. Um, this iteration of the project presented the user with a long string of text that she could move and manipulate across the screen by using a joystick. The second version of Legible City requires a fuller physical commitment from the viewer. In this phase of the city, the joystick is supplanted as the tool of control and navigation and replaced by the stationary bicycle. As the user begins to pedal, letters begin to move across the screen, coalescing into words, phrases, and sentences, as well as city streets and buildings. As the user rides and reads, and as I shall suggest in a moment, writes her way through this interactive text-based cityscape, she's able to choose different routes to lead her around town and to approach the different pathways and structures from various perspectives in this virtual space. In the final phase of the project, distributed legible city, <clears throat> Multiple bicycle riding users enter the city from different locations and are able to encounter each other either on, uh, on purpose or by happenstance while they read, ride, and create the text. In all its instances, Shaw's legible city, requiring as it does a human body to make it function, offers a clear, almost hyperbolic example of the importance of the body to the aesthetic experience um, of the new media art object, as well as how it functions itself as an interface for reading. Reading here is a social, physically demanding phenomenon. In the context of the history of the representation of reading, a common way to portray reading is to view it as isolating, and isolated, in which the body is neither fully attended to, nor present, nor active. Uh, rather, reading is frequently portrayed as a closed circuit between the eye, the hand, and the book. And we can look back to Picasso to see that. In such depictions, the environment that surrounds the subject seems somehow entirely cut off from or irrelevant to the reader, as if the reader were in a hermetically sealed bubble with only the text for company. Shaw's Legible City offers a rebuttal to these types of representations and resonates very well with the research that artists and theorists such as Anne Balsamo have done in conjunction with Xerox Park's Red Team, research and experimental documents, research that has insisted both upon the full body's prominence as a site of apprehension in the act of reading and question the spatial and structural limitations of typical reading devices and interfaces. I quote from Anne Balsamo, what happens when you have documents that could never be accommodated by a handheld device? 
looking at the role of the body and the role of the body in technology and how technologies are mediated through embodied experience and so on, we talked a great deal about how the whole body, and not just the eyes and the hands, is a reading apparatus. Insofar as Jeffrey Shaw's Legible City engages with these same types of questions, I see it as being well situated in this discourse, and it offers through its technological and embodied interfaces a way for us to view reading in a more complicated manner. And zooming out, we can see that the physicality of reading and the importance of the human body to the reading and writing experience are absolutely persistent preoccupations in literary history. Think Kafka's in the penal colony, think Kafka's scarlet letter, think Kafka's forlorn letter. Moreover, zooming out reminds us that the work's peculiar social aspect is echoed in the rich tradition of reading collectively and socially as a part of a larger reading community. In addition to placing the user into the role of the writer and reader, the project makes a writer out of the reader. And, and let me explain this. While there's no stylus level um, inscription in this work, by making choices about where to go, how fast to pedal, with whom to interact, and for how long, the writer generates a unique pattern of events, a narrative. We could, of course, spend some time distinguishing this type of narrative from those found in more traditional forms. For now, however, it suffices to say that this narrative, such as it is, becomes further enriched by the interaction with other writers and readers, and that it is only a small extrapolation to view their actions as participating in a form of collective authorship or production that can be situated within the types of collective efforts found on the web, and whose strategies we might want to think about in terms of our interest in reading interfaces. It may also be fruitful to consider the pathways that the writer takes in the legible city as a very physical representation or metaphor for textual analysis, and that the reader moves through the text, makes choices about it, and actually shapes and creates not only the text, but its meaning as a result of her action. Quite simply stated, the text as um, an interpretive entity in Legible City is created by the actions and decisions of the users moving through it. On the practical level, as a pedagogical tool for helping to explain the creative aspects of textual analysis, frequently um, something that is, can be difficult to, to get across, Legible City may prove very effective as a learning tool by showing that such analysis is something that one does in active uh, correspondence with the text. For my last section, I want to turn to my third and final assumption about reading in partnership with digital technology that it robs us of the individual experience unique to each reader of that wonderful electric friction between author, text, and reader. Instead, according to this assumption, reading becomes nothing but a collection of procedures for sifting information, for browsing, scanning, surfing, and scrolling through words. In the Transliteracy's Research Clearinghouse, there are many research reports that focus on reading as a collective activity that brings together a group of readers to one reading locus in the online or new media environment. In such spaces, multiple readers have access to the same text. They read it, they respond to it, and they help write it, either explicitly in the case of Wikipedia or indirectly or differently in the case of blogging platforms. This is extremely interesting, but I became just as interested in the way that reading is not just a collective activity, but a collecting one a process that not only allows people to come together and gather as a group of readers, but one that also involves the act of gathering, sorting, sifting, organizing, processing, and editing information. The insight into reading as a collecting activity comes from a seminar that I took uh, with Wolf Hitler in the German department at Santa Barbara, which is where I did my PhD. This was called Literally, Derrida Reads Plateau, Rousseau, and Artaud. In it, we looked at several etymologies in our reading, and not surprisingly for a course on this topic, etymologies of the word reading itself. The etymology of the word reading in English, <coughs> excuse me, reveals an emphasis um, on advising and interpretation. And note that English is the one of the few Western European languages that does not derive its verb to read from the Latin, legere. Read, instead, comes from the Old English verb to advise, interpret, something difficult, to interpret something written, um, and is related to the German verb, raten, to advise. 
In looking at the definitions of the Latin legere and the Greek legging, however, we could see this notion of collecting or gathering as something that is inherent to reading in Western tradition. And you can see I've underlined some really key uh, points from this definition. Reading is to pick, picking stones for building a wall um, in ancient Greek, to pick out, uh, to gather for oneself, to choose for oneself, to count. And um, harder to see, perhaps, uh, with this slide, but in, um, yeah, in, in the Latin, we have to survey, to scan, to read, to go over, to choose, to select, to pick out. And the one that I didn't mention here is, uh, that I think is just fantastic, to uh, pick out stones for building walls is something that's included in the etymology of the word to read in ancient Greek. So this is not to say, of course, that uh, etymologies reveal some sort of er meaning for our words about reading, but it seems worthwhile to look at these early versions of the concept of reading in order to argue that the act of collecting, something that seems so fraught in terms of new media advancements in the fields of data mining, searching, filtering, and information architecture, is something that has always been a vital part of what it means to read. So with these words fresh in our minds, I'd like to zoom from these ancient roots to the late 20th century to the almost precise moment in literary history when digital technology begins to coalesce in the public imagination in the form of cyberspace. This moment is in William Gibson's still famous novel, Neuromancer. Published in 1984, it gave the name to cyberspace and imagined a not too distant future in which digital technology is ubiquitous and reading per se becomes intimately linked with computation. In this telling passage that I'm going to show you, the main character, whose name is Case, seeks information about a group called the Panther Moderns. We see here that he asks the Hosaka, which is a computer, for information about the moderns, and the computer's response is a swiftly composed composite. What's interesting about this passage, I'm not going to read it, I hope you, you can see it, is that what occurs is a very, very succinct um, act of selection on the part of the computer. Text is not something to be read or saved. The crazy that the computer generates contains, in fact, no text at all. Instead, we have commands, image cues, camera language, collage, and montage. montage. Reading is pure extraction browsing, sifting, taking what's needed and moving on. The text provides a pool of information from which the reader can skim for the most enticing details. The text itself has no autonomy or any kind of individual authorial weight. Writing here becomes an act of compiling, and reading becomes the act of reading what has been compiled. Gibson's fictional work is instructive. It shows how the act of selecting becomes deferred and relegated to automatic processes. This, I argue, is what we should be focusing on. Not the fact that we select information when we read online, not that we browse and skim, select and serve. We've always done that, and we will continue to do so. Instead, we might want to pay more attention to the work that's being done for us. To be sure, we've always had help with parsing information, from page breaks to chapter headings to paragraphs and punctuation. But how many of us think through how this parsing unfolds? Consider, for example, a popular song um, by Daft Punk called Technologic, which demonstrates the tension between automation and individual selection. I'm going to play just a little bit of the song. How many of you have heard it before? A couple of you? Okay. song um, are the lyrics. Um, and something to keep in mind is that Gibson's fiction um, in some ways is really prescient about what it is that I'm, I'm going to show you here. 
um, this, this idea that representations of reading as a turn away from a focused, absorptive, and isolated experience um, is something that's kind of uh, foretelling where we are at right now from, from 1984. Okay, so here is the song uh, that I just played the clip from, and here are the lyrics. And you notice that in, this, um, in, in these lyrics, everything, almost everything, is a command. Um, except for two brief adverbs. The term it has absolutely no antecedent. We don't know what it is. Um, the text here is nothing but what can be done to it, right? There's no content that we're aware of. The relationship between text and process here is exciting and elastic and a little bit skewed from how we're used to understanding that relationship. Songs like Technologic and books like Neuromancer speak to larger social uh, reading practice. Consider the way collective and collecting occur in the larger online environment, as well as what happens when the act of collecting or selecting becomes an automated or partially automated part of the reading process. We seem fairly comfortable talking about reading as a collective activity, both historically and today. We could talk about how the new media environment is adding to the history of collective reading and writing in many interesting ways. Consider two examples of collective reading in which multiple readers engage together in relation to a text. For example, listening to a sermon or reading, on, uh, reading wikis and blogs. You could argue that there are many similarities between the two acts and, of course, many differences. We can similarly consider two examples of reading as collecting in which a reader chooses information from a text in a process that I take to include gathering, selection, sorting, sifting, organizing, filtering, and editing. For example, excerpting a textual passage for biblical, legal, or literary analysis, or typing in a term into Google's I'm feeling lucky search form. Again, we might see many similarities between these two examples, but one difference between them might be the manner in which invisible automated processes enable the latter. Consider Giselle Begelman's Ask for Escape, a fascinating collection of computer error messages that the artist has collected from users around the world. In contrast to the other sites I've looked at that have employed a high level of automation in the act of gathering, for example, Wikipedia or, um, for, or Google, um, Begelman's work here, although a collection, is rather a collection of automated responses. Esk for Escape is a multifaceted art project that solicits and archives error messages from computer users around the globe and re-expresses them in a variety of contexts and media. Accompanying the project are several visualizations that the artist has created to complement the anxieties about automation found in her book of errors. In this animated GIF, for example, the exaggerated expression of fear, even horror, on the woman's face is further exacerbated by the violent shaking. The collective and collecting aspects of this project are particularly interesting. In some sense, what differentiates this piece from other works is precisely this collaborative nature. While Begelman is certainly the master architect of the overall project responsible for the visual interpretations featured on the project's website, as well as for wrangling the live exhibition and maintaining the online archive, the core of the project, that is, the error messages themselves, represent a variety of voices and social contexts from around the world. By gathering examples of automation gone awry, Begelman's work manages to do what more highly automated collection tools and search engines do not. It reveals, to at least some extent, the largely invisible processes that drive acts of collecting and gathering. As for Escape expresses very well anxieties about automated processes in the online reading environment. The representations here are perhaps indicative of a greater trend of suspicion about automated collecting, searching, gathering, and yes, reading. Consider Wikipedia. Anxieties about the reliability of such information. Um, it, oh, excuse me. Consider Wikipedia. In early 2007, the History Department of Middlebury College in Vermont instituted a ban on using Wikipedia articles as a source in any research assignment. Anxieties about the reliability of such information source is not limited to Vermont. UCLA has considered the ban, and the issue of authority of wiki authors is hotly contested on a variety of forum, forums, including, it is fair to add, forums on Wikipedia. One of the fears or anxieties that many of us have as educators is that our students' ease of access can only impair their collecting skills 
if they're not in the practice of validating and investigating their information sources, that is, if they no longer have to do the hard work of picking up the stones for building walls, this can only hamper their critical skills, and the collecting and critical aspects of reading will atrophy. But do we buy this claim? I, I don't think that I do. I feel as though I am going out on a limb, but I would suggest that we might want to think about problems fraught with building walls in the first place. And by way of conclusion, I'd like to say that the assumptions i would held about reading have evolved. And as risky and live as it is to zoom in and out of history, I'd like to celebrate the power of the power zoom because it helps us find continuities and clarifies fissures in the literary and historical tradition. And once we contextualize innovation, we can more effectively begin to shape it. Thank you. Uh, you'll excuse me if I'm not going to talk about paintings. Um, I have to say, uh, um, coming out of a background in the literacy studies, uh, I, have to, I, uh, I find that Swanson's uh, zooming work, this, uh, this survey of visual reading as an nexus of practice, very exciting. Um, um, uh, I'll say that I want to begin my response um, by uh, addressing something in the middle of the text uh, with uh, Swanson's uh, uh, provocative and elegant description of the uh, um, etymology of Latin for reading as the uh, collective and collecting work of picking up the picking up of stones to build walls. But because of a cruel trick of scholarship, not my own, um, I'll actually begin at the end of the paper with the uh, thinking of this as a, uh, as a social practice. Um, so in 1998, in 1988, I'm sorry, in the, in, in the eminent sociological journal, journal of Social Problems, an obscure scholar, um, Jim Johnson, a technologist teaching at the Ohio School of Mines, uh, began a paper by considering an issue related to the etymology of Leger, specifically walls. Walls are a nice invention, Johnson wrote, but if there are no holes in them, there would be no way to get in or out. They would be mausoleums or tombs. The problem in this if they, is that if you make holes in the walls, anything and anyone can get in and out. Bears, visitors, dust, rats, noise. So architects invented this hybrid, a whole wall, often called a door, through which, although common enough, has always struck me as a miracle of technology. Once you have passed through the door, you do not have to find trial and submit to rebuild the wall you've just destroyed. You simply push the door gently back. And thus began a very lengthy excursus on the role of the door closer, or, do or room, the device that appears above a door, preventing it from slamming after a person passes through. Johnson argued that the non-human door closer should be considered something akin to a non-human actor. Uh, shaping and structuring people's interactions with one another and the door, even as it is situated within a nexus of organizational labor and social relations. By now, the savvy and I might add very patient among you might have guessed that um, uh, uh, Jim Johnson was actually a pseudonym for a um, scholar by the name of Bruno Latour. A pseudonymic trick on the part of Latour. And I think Swanson is right to draw parallels between her work here and that of Latour, of mapping out the place of new representational technologies within larger socio-technical networks of practice. As work on the social history of literacy tells us, the collective and collecting work of reading has always been a social and technical practice that is situated within a larger network of cultural and historical relations. Perhaps if we take up this work, as Swanson does, of mapping out the relationship between the socio-historical practice of reading and the affordances of new visual representational forms of investigating reading as a nexus of searching, scanning, browsing, and mining, we will find the tools to build doors as well as walls. Thank you. Maybe the easiest way to do that would be to go back to three images and 
represented um, of Picasso, um, the girl reading on a beach, um, of the man reading in the garden who's reading a newspaper, the woman who's reading on, by gaslight um, in a domestic interior. Um, I think in, in each of these three instances, we're not dealing with simply people who are isolated within their own contemporary and social worlds, but actually three very historically different modes of interacting with the book, different modes of um, literary you know, presentation, um, and also different modes of sociality, right, um, that are predicated by you know, new inventions like the gas, like, like um, lending libraries, perhaps, um, um, and like the newspaper, which already, you know, in, at the end of the 19th century, induced this real anxiety about the fate of literature, right? And, um, and reading on a beach, you know, that's predicated also by you know, the introduction of cardboard bound books that are kind of portable. So, you know, I think there's all sorts of ways in which the kind of material history of books, of reading, um, and, you know, on some level, the kind of anxieties and tensions that are at play between literature, texts, and books. I mean, I guess my, my question has, has to do, I mean, from there, I wanted to kind of pose a question about the specificity of the kinds of texts. Um, to what extent, you know, the, this whole kind of question about Wikipedia, you know, we have reading, in the, if we understand reading as collecting, that's far less problematic than understanding reading as interpretation, evaluation, mm -hmm. and you know, analysis. Or, I guess I wanted, I'd like to hear some more, a kind of more specific description of what you mean by reading, what you mean by Great, it's a great question. Um, and the samples of images in the kind of history of artistic representation of reading are, are very select uh, just for this presentation. It's been a sort of pet project of mine to just kind of gather different types. And I think um, it's something that I would, I, I could see actually being a very useful resource for people to see instances of the specific type of material practices and reading practices um, that went into each instance. And so, um, unfortunately, you know, glossed over them really quickly here. But I absolutely agree that each moment is particular. It's a time capsule of a certain set of cultural practices. And to to answer your your, your question about uh, a more specific definition of reading, I think what I'd like to say, and this is going to be hedging my bets a bit, but I'd like to say that reading. Um, I, I guess it, this talk comes from a frustration that I have about the either-or camps of reading, that reading is either the singular pursuit or reading is this distracted thing that occurs online um, that's just run amok and that we have no control over. And what I want to suggest is that um, reading historically has always involved both, right? And so I think that we could point to many instances where you have both a collective social group surrounded around a text as well as acts of working together to interpret that text um, that line up really well with uh, works like Wikipedia and, and blogs such as that. So it's a little bit of a hedge, but that's kind of where I want to go with it, is to not pin down reading to, to you know, one of these things, but to open it up and say that this type of you know, reading that I'm talking about here, um, both close reading and distracted reading, both building walls, uh, and, I, and I love Ben's reference to opening up doors, is something that you can see all throughout literary history, and just to acknowledge that um, this is not new, right? To a certain extent, to a certain extent. Does that, does that help yeah, start Yeah, I guess, to? I mean, it, it's not new, but it's also specific to this moment, right? I mean, I, I guess one of the things that I, so I, I guess I should say I work on you know, early 20th century mm -hmm. avant-garde, It seems to me that your conception of reading involves two different activities, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the activity of the textual and also book or interface production, right, in design. And, you know, are you also addressing some sort of producing perception theory? Or is this, do you see what I mean? Like, I was wondering, in terms of your project, it seems like you're trying to kind Exactly what I'd say is, is 
my insight is that, that you don't. And there's so much scholarship out there that, that does. <laughs> and um, and it, not just not just in you know scholarship in the ivory tower, but in, in the popular media, which you know we have to be sensitive to. And so I think that if I were to say one thing that is contemporary that I think departs from this larger sort of big spectrum of the history of reading, you know, that I'm saying that all along we've been collective and collecting as, as we read, right? So the one thing to me that seems to distinguish our current moment, reading today, right now online, is the, the greater use of automated processes to help us do so. That to me is where I want to focus my attention. Um, and I think that it would be useful for more people to focus their attention upon these automated processes because it's true that we've always been selective and selecting. We've always been gathering information. Um, and if you think about reading as a way of ordering the world, um, and you think about myths about collecting things, you think about um, Cupid and Psyche, Psyche's search for you know these impossible tasks that Aphrodite puts her on, right? She has to sort um, all of these different grains into different piles. And in that story, I don't know if you remember, but she gets help from, from gods, from animal creatures, right? So there's this myth that's persistent in um, literary history of having to do these massive amounts of selection and getting divine help from it. So I think there's something there in the tradition, but right now, um, we're not really paying attention as much to what is helping us. And I think that's uh, really worth considering. back at history, um, reading to see um, how to project what uh, we might be noticing the problems and problem solving uh, in the current environments. One of the things I want to interesting about the history is how long it took us to figure out we see the inventions, you know, the plowing of the field, I mean, I know this is part of, you know, the work that, you know, should the lions all start at the lab or should they go plow the field? It took a long time for people to separate one bird from the other. Uh, it took a long time for people to figure out that maybe I'll uh, make each individual letter legible. Yeah. Um, there should be punctuation, I mean, all these kinds of things we think are obvious. It took people a very long time. The reason why people read aloud in the old, way old days was because it was so difficult to figure out which word was which. Uh, could you project from that? Do you, what, what, do you, uh, what could you project about some of the ways of displaying information in today's environments that aren't going to someday seem just completely crazy or? Ridiculous, like, yeah, of course you would separate the words, of course you would make letters legible. Me, yeah, about those kind of things? my predictive abilities. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know about that, but I, um, the idea that um, we parse information and that parsing information has been this long literary process down to pages and text, uh, spaces between text, punctuation, columns, uh, chapter headings, etc., was actually something that we really paid close attention to in transliteracies. And I and some of my colleagues um, created um, a flash animation of just that process. And so we started with a clump of text um, from uh, the book of John, and the beginning was the word, and the word was of God, right? And it was just a repeated text, and it started out in this clump, and we showed exactly how it is that this text in particular was parsed throughout biblical history. And we realized that the Bible itself is this incredible engine of literary change and, and form. And so one of the things that we realized was how naturalized we've become to those spatial and formatting conventions. We don't think of page numbers as technologies, but I tell you, if you're in the rare books collection and you're trying to find a certain section of the Bible, oh man, is it hard, right? <laughs> and then you're trying not to ruin the book at the same time, and you are lacking all of those cues that we're so used to having. So in terms of predicting what it is that might seem just so um, laughable you know, in the future, I'm not sure. Um, one thing I think is that, uh, you know, what Henry Jenkins has called um, this idea of like collective intelligence uh, coming together, that group intelligence is, you know, often greater than, than individual intelligence and becomes greater than the sum of its parts, is something that seemed novel um, when convergence culture came out. And I think more and more it's not so novel. I think that's being accepted. So that might be something. Um, well, that's about novel, uh, novelty and that perhaps is Status of the kind of evidence you're appealing to for the future of reading practice. So, in, in arguing that close reading is also a part of digital 
-hmm. you gave us examples that uh, are artistic mm -hmm. products uh, that um, one could argue represent, they certainly represent practices in the digital realm because they exist. On the other hand, um, one, one might ask, well, how widespread are those practices? Uh, you know, how many people have read Lexia and Perplexia as opposed to the number of users of Facebook? Um, does it matter? So that's my question. Sort of, what is the status of using evidence from what are uh, explicitly special texts mm -hmm. that may therefore explicitly be asking readers or users to exercise facilities that they don't exercise in other kinds of practices, uh, as opposed to a uh, kind of uh, looking for other sort of sociological approaches to thinking about reading practices in a particular age, either for the present day or in the past. I think the problem with the past is that the further back you get, the less, in many cases, the less uh, evidence there is except artistic text, right? You know, or, or the evidence becomes archaeological, it becomes difficult. Um, but I'd just like you to comment on the status of using this kind of evidence to argue generally about what people read. Absolutely. Um, it's, it's a completely fair question because I think the status of what we call electronic literature um, is already shifting, right? I mean, it had, um, I don't want to say it's had its heyday, I don't, I don't believe that at all, but I think it kind of came into popularity more in academic circles in the, in the early and mid-90s, turn, you know, turn of the century, turn of the millennium, and that now it's there, but the status of electronic literature really is called into question when we have such intricate, beautiful, complicated games to play, when we have such popular forms that are online that people are interacting with all the time. And so I agree that uh, Lexia to Perplexia is kind of a, a rare bird, right? Um, so it, it's a tough one. I would say that for those people who read electronic literature, there are plenty of texts, right, that, that do the same things that uh, Mehmet's text does that require um, and demand close active reading. Um, but I take your point about about using that to, to prove a larger trend, and, and but I do think that um, I do think that it, it, it will be in gaming um, as something that's a really um, interesting collection of complicated narratives that people engage with actively, um, that they share information about, um, that they get together to, to play it and to sometimes write them. Um, that we might you know be focusing on. Yeah, I am. Um, because I think uh, one thing that I've, uh, and, and, and to, be, to be completely honest, full disclosure, growing up, I was that kid reading alone <laughs> all the time in that kind of absorptive reading experience, which is why I had such a hard time accepting reading as something that is not that experience, right? Um, but I do. I, I've kind of, uh, I've, I've come to terms with the idea that reading is something that, uh, encompasses a vast array of cultural practices. And I do kind of think of it more as a way of making sense of the world as a whole than I do as just that one type of reading where I'm alone by myself with my book, although you know, those times are also wonderful.